Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here today. By the way, if you haven't gotten a bulletin, any of you don't have a bulletin? Need one? Could you use one over here? We have an extra bulletin over there. Thank you, Darren, if you could bring that over here. Personally escorted by Darren, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's not for me, I don't read the thing. I just wanted to point out to you if, you, if you open your bulletin, we have all of our announcements in there. You'll notice Carl doesn't come up and do the usual spiel because like a third of everyone that's here comes in after that, so it doesn't really make much sense. And those are the people that always say, so when is the picnic this summer? It's in the bulletin. By the way, it's July 1st. We're having a picnic at Homedale Park. We have the Forest Edge area that's uh, reserved for us. I, I took care of that, so we're ready to rock and roll, so re reserve the date for July 1st, and uh, bring a friend, bring some food, bring a Frisbee, a volleyball, wear your flip-flops, <laughs> things that we wouldn't do here necessarily. And also, where's Dan Martin? He was over there. There he is. There he is. Dan, stand up. Dan, one of the newest members of our church right there, ladies and gentlemen. You weren't here last week for me to embarrass you, so <laughs> just taking this opportunity, right. Well, it's always, it's always difficult for me to shift from an event like the resurrection and then go right back to Genesis and plug back in. At least it was hard for me to be able to kind of pick up where we left off, and maybe it is for you too, but uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this morning, the opportunity to come into your presence with your blessing because of Jesus. We come before you, Lord, broken and battered and burdened. And Lord, you know the things on our hearts, you know the events in our lives, you know the struggles that we have. And Lord, I know that you're waiting to bring us through those things to victory. We're glad to be here this morning. I pray that you'd give our hearts rest in your presence, that you might sharpen all of our minds and our hearts, that we might understand what it is you have for us this morning. All of us, including myself, Lord, we come here to be shepherded by you, to be fed by your word. And Lord, I know that you don't disappoint. I just pray that you prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us today. I thank you for every soul here and those who are online who watch from far away. I pray that your spirit might fill us and help us to be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. So here we are, Lord. I pray that you do your work. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So we are back in Genesis Oh, I forgot to tell everyone to shut their phones off. Turn your phones off. If you, have a if you have a telephone, you can shut it off now so that we don't embarrass you publicly like I did Daniel Martin. Just to let you know recently what we've been looking at in the book of Genesis, we're looking at the, the life of Jacob and how Jacob was called by God that he would be the one who would carry the blessing that was given to Abraham, and he was spoken of before he was even born. And he has an encounter with God in chapter 28 where the Lord meets him. And this is the first time that we see he has a relationship with God. And he has this vision of the, the stairway that goes up and down. He sees these angels going up and down into heaven. And Jesus later on tells us that he is that stairway. He's that ladder between God and man. And it's, it's just real interesting how Jesus is good enough to take all of those Old Testament things and bring them to be relevant to us. So we see that Jacob now has a relationship with God. 
but he has some lessons to learn. So he goes away to a man who's a bigger con artist than he is <laughs> so that God might burn that junk out of his life. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had the pleasure of having God work out some of your idiosyncrasies in your life. If you've, if you've had a tendency to be uh, loose with your mouth, the Lord will put you with somebody who's even looser. And you go, oh my goodness, I can't believe the way they're speaking. And then everybody looks at you like, do you hear the way you speak? Or you'll have somebody who, you know, you have to work with who's even messier than you. And then suddenly you're like, wow, that person's a mess. And then you go home and you go, this looks a lot like work. <laughs> it's funny how God burns off those impurities in our life and he causes us to mature by exposing us to an even greater degree so that we might see it. Uh, sometimes God is gracious enough to lead us just through speaking to our hearts. Sometimes we need the example of others and sometimes we need to fall down to realize that it's not a good idea to fall down. And so is the case with Jacob. He goes before Laban and Laban is now trying to work a deal. Uh, he, he meets a he meets Rachel. Rachel's beautiful, and he bargains for seven years for her, but he ends up with four wives by the time it's all over because Laban is really taking advantage of him, and so he, he milks it. And then you have to share your husband with the wives, which I have no clue what that is like. Ladies, is that something that you think you'd enjoy? If you talk to a Mormon, they tell you it's a great thing. It's wonderful. You know, because you have one wife that cooks. You have one wife that is good with the kids. And you have another one that's there for recreation. You, you know, so everybody kind of takes, it's like a labor union sort of mentality. Um, the scripture is very clear from Genesis that he created one man and one woman. And that's the paradigm. It's not two women. It's not two men. It's one man and one woman, and that's what God's designed it to be. And it works well that way. It's hard. Amen? Amen. How many married people here? My goodness. I don't even get a hearty amen from that. It's hard. Relationships are hard because people are different. Men and women are fundamentally different in the way they think, in their biology, and the way they deal with things emotionally. No amen with the emotionally. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps it's just me and you, baby. It's just you and me that are so different. She's got the big heart, and, and I have the hard head. We saw in 1 Corinthians that not everybody, in fact, not most people, are stellar examples of perfection when God picks us, right? In fact, he picks us because we're not. He takes us from a place of zero, and he fills us with himself, and he does remarkable things with our lives so that he gets the glory for it and it's not about us. So not many of us were, according to worldly standards, something or somebody. We always wonder, gee, you know, if God would to save somebody like Tom Hanks, boy, the things he could do for Christ, why would he be able to do any more than you or I? Right. Right. And as far as I know, God hasn't chosen him yet. Amen. So pray for him. So we looked at what it's like to have multiple wives and how not having children can be such an incredible burden for women, especially in this culture, and especially if they're only bearing daughters and not young men. We see that Rachel says, you know, give me children or I die, which is a very impassioned plea, which I would never advise anyone to say such a thing because she ends up bearing one more child after Joseph, and it turns out that she does die. So I'm sure that those words kind of ring in the ears of her husband. But So we saw all of the children and Bilhah coming into the, the mix who, you know, she's a handmaid and suddenly now she's a wife. She got kind of conned into that. I'm not sure how consensual that was, but there it was. And then you have Dan, which is born, and Naphtali, which is my wrestling, and all of their names have a reflection to the relationship that they have to their husband, the, the ladies. Uh, Zilpah means a trickling, um, and Gad means troop, and Asher means happy. So finally, we get to a place where a kid's got a happy for a good name. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that uh, you're happy. You're happy because other ladies are going to call you blessed. Uh, it's interesting how our own personal self-images have a lot to do with how we even name our kids. 
which is a, a sad story. So we've gotten to see that. We saw the whole mandrake issue with, uh, you know, I, I think maybe I need a little help conceiving, so I'm going to need some of those mandrakes that your son found in the field. And it was negotiated that, well, you could sleep with them tonight and I'll get the mandrakes. And so sex trade, not a good thing, even early on in the scriptures. And so we see that that all backfires because Rachel doesn't bear any children out of all of this, but the other wife does. So don't try such things. And then finally, Rachel gives birth to Joseph. Joseph, not the 11th of all of the boys. And of course, Dinah is in there, but she's not really mentioned. Uh, just recognizing that God is the one who causes children to come, whether you use extraordinary means or regular means, God is the one who handles that. And life is to be valued because it's God's hand in all of it. And so just so, I, sometimes I feel I need this with some people I know who have a big family and have multiple partners. I need a flow chart. You know, I need to figure out who belongs to who and how they got there. Um, some people's family tree is very, very linear, like a telephone pole. Um, but this is not. So looking at all of them, finally, Jacob says, listen, I'm done. I served my 14 years for you so that I can marry these daughters. And uh, we see Laban saying, oh, come on, can't you stick around? I mean, God's blessed you and you're a good guy to have. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what, we got to work something out here because I got to get paid for my work. And he says, okay, stick around and uh, what do you want for your wages? And it's interesting because he says, what I'd like to do is pick out all the speckled and striped animals and claim them for myself. And if you know anything about genetics, you know that that's a recessive gene, especially in, in, these, in these worlds where they characterize a solid coat more than they do the speckled and spotted. And so he says, just give me those. And he says, okay. And he takes all the speckled and spotted ones, takes them out and gives them to his kids and sends them three days away. And he goes, okay, now you can start serving. You're going to start from zero. What a dirty dog. See, Jacob thought at least he'd get some animals to begin with and take care of, but he's got zero. So he makes him take care of all of his solid sheep and goats and cattle and he has to wait for them to manufacture these speckled and striped ones, which, you know, it's a recessive gene, so it doesn't happen very often. So Laban is really, really leaning into Jacob and taking advantage of him, but he's the guy who took advantage of his own father and his own brother. God is burning out this really terrible characteristic in Jacob. Eventually, he's going to give him a new name, and he's not going to be called Jacob anymore, or at least He's been given a name, but it doesn't really stick. Well, we'll see when we get there. So it's this conversation between these con artists, and he says, stick around, and so he does. <clears throat> but he sticks around so long to the point where he doesn't want to be there anymore. And he produces all of these speckled and spotted sheep. And it's interesting because we see God's the one who gives him this plan to select the spotted and the speckled ones and the striped ones. The Lord spoke to him and t said, just select those. And Laban will go along with that because that means Laban gets the lion's share and you get just this little bit of recessive gene thing. So Laban is really taking advantage of him, but we're going to see in this chapter, he's had enough. He's got to get out of a situation. I don't know, have you ever stayed at a job way too long? I thought maybe that was the case. Or you stayed faithful in a relationship for way too long? Or you, or you stayed going to a particular church for way too long. I have memories of all these things, staying way too long. And there's a dysfunctional relationship that's wrapped up in that. And, you know, there are reasons why we do such things. And I don't have enough time to counsel all of you nor myself in front of you. There are reasons why we do that. I don't know about you, but I, I value faithfulness. And so uh, I'll, I'll hold on uh, to the last fingernail. And uh, sometimes that's not what God would have us do because we ruin relationships that way. Right. Amen? Yeah. So, verse 1 of chapter 31 begins this way. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob has taken away all that is our father's. And from what was our father's, he has acquired all this wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban. 
And indeed, it was not favorable toward him as it was before. And the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. Notice some words. It says that Jacob heard. It says that Jacob saw. There's a way to read a room. There's a way to read a person. You guys know that? You can't absolutely know anything, but there's a way to read. And I think he heard some things from the sons that they were complaining that Jacob had been doing so well, that God had blessed him so much that he was stealing from Laban, which isn't the truth. He's working for it. He's working hard at it. And he's making sure that the strong animals uh, that are speckled and spotted are doing well. And the other animals, he, they don't necessarily have to reproduce. <laughs> and, and so he's taking special care of his stuff. And these guys see him as a thief. And, though, and he feels, they feel like he's stealing their inheritance. Right? That's a real problem. When the family that you're serving sees you as a threat, like if you've ever been part of a family business, you know, when it, when it comes time to lop heads off, it's going to be yours first, unless it's your family. And then maybe you'll get special favor. But he's got trouble, and he's beginning to see that things aren't going well. I, I put stop, look, and listen. You have to pay attention to your environment. You have to pay attention to what's going on around you, because sometimes... God will cause that to happen so that you don't stay where you shouldn't stay. I, there are a thousand examples, but I don't have all morning. <laughs> Jacob's situation soured on him. There was this kind of a holy dissatisfaction. And not only did he see and hear things that were derogatory and negative that would force him to say, I'm not so at home here anymore. But also the Lord spoke to him and said, listen, you need to go back to your family. But there's a problem there, isn't there? Because he ripped off his dad in deceit and he robbed his brother Esau, who's a manly man, who was speaking of killing him. So the Lord's saying, listen, you need to leave this very uncomfortable space to go back to that other uncomfortable space. And sometimes the Lord will do that if you haven't sewed up the loose ends. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So Jacob's situation sours in Jeremiah 17, 9. It says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's hard to know whether God is really calling us to do a thing or not. Any of you experience this? Let me just see a hand. Five, 10, 12. All right, good, good, good. The honesty is coming slowly. Good. <laughs> understanding, understanding God's will for your life and you're like, Lord, what do you want me to do here? Well, it's beautiful because this is before the Word of God. Now, we have the Word of God, which is examples, which we're reading here today, which are good for us to learn from. But these guys didn't have the benefit that we have. And so the Lord came to him and specifically said, you got to go back home. Now, I'm sure this was kind of good news and kind of bad news because now he's got to face his brother who was threatening to kill him. Okay, well, at least it's better than hanging out with Laban for another 20 years. So sometimes a bad situation has a worse situation, and you'll leave the worst situation for a bad situation. It's just the way it is sometimes, isn't it? Yep. And for us to understand what God's will is just from circumstance alone is a very chancy thing, isn't it? Like, if being a pastor here is very difficult for me, should I leave? Why not? Because my heart is desperately wicked above all things, and I may not necessarily divine from God his perfect will. And so my tendency, and so you should know yourself, my tendency is to stay to the last fingernail. And I don't take a hint real easy. I'm like Peter. I need three times. <laughs> and because I know that, I try to be extra sensitive to the things that the Lord speaks to me. So I realize that my heart could say, well, listen, I'm unappreciated here. I'm out of here. I'm going somewhere. You know, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else where I'm appreciated. That's not the voice of God. Sometimes you push through. And sometimes you got to know when to fold them. You got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to walk away. 
got to know when to run. I'm sorry. Anyway. Psalm 23.3 says, He restores my soul and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. One of the ways that God leads us is sometimes through circumstance. And I say sometimes because it's not always. Sometimes he wants us to hold them. And so we do so. But he does lead us and we should be sensitive that God uses such things as this. In Deuteronomy 32.11 it says, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. It's really interesting. If you know anything about eagles, uh, when the babies get to the place where they can actually fly, you'll see them spread their wings and they actually catch some wind and they'll kind of hover up above the nest. And that's when the mother knows they're ready to take their first flight. They figured out how to work these, these ugly looking wings. You know, they're, they're really fuzzy and, and cute when they're young, but man, then they, they get, go through an ugly stage and then they kind of get beautiful. But um, this is the largest eagle, by the way. This is called a harpy. And that's an eagle. It's, uh, this one's a picture of a man in Germany with a harpy. It's actually a real eagle and it's the largest eagle on the face of the planet. What they do when they're young, get to the place where they need to fly, is they pull all the soft stuff out of the nest. And the, the claws on this thing are incredible. They're, they're as big as my fingers. They pull all the soft stuff out of the nest, and the babies are like suddenly very uncomfortable here. And it encourages them to go. And when the mother knows that it's right, she nudges them out of the nest. Now she watches, and what she does is she'll get up underneath them as they go, ah! <laughs> she actually gets up under them and, and flies and picks them up and helps them to fly, which is a rather interesting thing. Sometimes she actually grabs onto their wings, and you can see two of them flying together. This is sometimes what God does to us. He'll make it very uncomfortable for us to stick around. And he'll make it obvious that we need to leave the nest. And I think that's what's happening here with Jacob. He heard some things from the sons. He saw some things from Laban and he heard from God. So he's got the trifecta of maybe I need to get the heck out of here because I'm very uncomfortable and I think like the Lord's leading me on. And by the way, that's not unusual. It's not strange. And I could show you example upon example. We go back a few chapters. We go to Lot and the Lord made it very uncomfortable for them to live together. They didn't have enough room. And so he said, Abraham said to um, Lot, listen, you go east, I'll go west. You go north, I'll go south. You pick a place and I'll go in the other direction. I'm giving you first pick. And the Lord caused that for them to separate. And you know, I can show you examples in the New Testament where he uses situations which become very uncomfortable, which causes us to go to the next thing. I would never think about jumping out of a 40-story window unless the building were on fire. And then I will jump and it's sometimes like that when maybe we're reluctant to be led, God will use a poker. I'm just saying. So my, my lesson from this is he sometimes makes us uncomfortable to move us from our current situation. Be aware of that. Sometimes he will use your situation. Not always. Sometimes he wants you to just tough it out and deal with it but sometimes he uses those situations to move you on. Amen? Amen? Okay. So Jacob sent and he called Rachel and Leah to the field, to his flock. He's calling them in. And said to them, I see your father's countenance that it is not favorable toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might, I have served your father. Let Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages 10 times. How would you like that? These aren't increases, by the way. But God did not allow him to hurt me. So his situation is definitely soured, and he's trying to give his wives the heads up, explaining the situation to them so that the wives understand what's going on because he's about to ask them to do something very difficult, which is to leave. And they've been there with their, with their father all their life. They've been in a very comfortable place too. And so he's interested in giving them the heads up and getting a buy-in from them. For us as Christians, it's God's word that directs our actions in life, isn't it? 
It's not always situations. But situations need to be taken into the mix, and we need to bring them before the Lord and say, Lord, are you trying to tell me something here? And so we do. The scripture says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I find very often, if I'm really interested in knowing what God wants for my life, in my daily opening of his word, he'll speak to me. I'll read something and go, aha. Or Sunday morning, maybe you'll hear something from up here and you'll be like, how did you know? I don't know. I don't know anything. But the Lord does. And his word is so good about cutting through all of that. But it's good to get some perspective and an outside point of view, isn't it? In fact, I think it's very wise to do so. It's interesting because if you look, he's looking at Laban and saying, listen, you know how hard I worked and this guy's changed my, he's ripping me off. Oh, remember what Jacob did before he got here? He's a con man. And not only that, he really didn't work with all of his heart for Laban's flocks. He worked for his own flocks. So he still has something yet to, to burn off of his selfishness and his self-centeredness, doesn't he? And he's kind of like having a big stick in your own eye and pointing out the speck in somebody else's eye, right? Like Jesus said, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye when you have a, a moat, actually, it's the old King James, a beam hanging out of your own eye? And Jesus said, remove the beam from your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It doesn't mean that we're not responsible to see specks and help remove them, but you're disqualified if you've got a big old beam sticking out of your own. And I see the case with Jacob. He's not qualified to judge Laban because he doesn't exactly live the right life just yet, but the Lord's working on him. If he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. So he's explaining to his wives exactly what happened and how it happened. It used to be, the striped, the ringed, and the spotted. He'd get all of them because there weren't any in the beginning. There were zero. He took them all out. And then suddenly they started proliferating and Laban's cattle didn't seem to be doing as well. So he says, okay, I'm going to take back the spotted ones. You can have the ringed ones and the, and the striped ones. And suddenly they were all ringed and striped. And he goes, well, I'm just going to give you the striped ones now. You know, like he just kept changing his wages 10 times. Can you imagine going into work and your boss tells you you're getting another pay cut? And is it the 10th time he's telling you? Most of us wouldn't deal with that, right? That's why God made lawyers. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe he didn't. Okay. So he brings his wives in on this decision because it's going to be their future as well. And Jacob explains the true nature of his success is God blessing him. And we haven't actually seen that up until this point. It's God who showed him how to do this and that he should do it. Do you see the successes in your life as God blessing you? Or do you think, well, it's because I'm so charismatic. It's because I'm tall for my weight. Or do we see the blessings that come into our life as from God? I see Jacob is thankful because he sees the blessings being from God's direction. And I think that's important for all of us because we can get full of ourselves and think it's all about us. And it's really not. So as it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted up my eyes and I saw in a dream and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks, this is reproduction, were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am which is the right response. And he said, lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks are striped, speckled, and gray spotted. And I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. So he's, he's, he's putting this down on his wives. This is what happened. The same God I met at Bethel is the same God who spoke to me about the reproduction of all these animals, is the same God that said, you need to get back to your family's homeland. And so he's giving them the vision. 
gentlemen, it's a good idea that you communicate such things to your wives. Why are you all so quiet? <laughs> it's a good idea for your wife to be involved in the decision-making process of your home. Amen? Amen. Oh, it's very weak. Okay. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to be like Abraham and say, come on, we're going to go to a place where the Lord will show us. Well, where are we going? I don't know yet. I'll let you know when he tells me. That is a much harder thing to do. It's much easier when you can get on board and you have a conference and you get of one mind and at least there's some, you know, unanimous opinion. So he says, this is what happened. Jacob's situation soured, but number two, God's still small voice sweetened. Going through a place of decision, the Lord comes to him and speaks to him. You can know that. Sometimes it's a situation getting sour, but sometimes it's the voice of God that gets sweeter. And you begin to hear things and the Lord begins to lead you and guide you. And it's important that we listen when he begins to do that. Amen? Amen? Because it's always better to be led by God than to be driven by hardship and circumstance. Right? Please say yes, because that means that you want to be driven by hardship and circumstance. I would much rather be led by God than driven like cattle. That's the difference between sheep and cows, by the way. Sheep are led and cows are prodded. Depends on which end of the stick you want to be on. <laughs> so God is faithful to Jacob to lead him in the most important times of his life. And we're going to see this over and over again. You remember when he left his family's house and he was on his way, he stops at Bethel and God meets with him. He's now over here with Laban. And after all of these years, we haven't heard anything about God speaking to him until he says, it's time for you to go back home. It's at those times when he has to make big decisions that the Lord shows up and gives him direction. It'll be the same for you if you seek his face. In fact, usually we need a tragedy like that to seek his face, don't we? If every day were a tragedy, you see where I'm going? Maybe we should view every day as though we need to be dependent on him. And then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? Remember, he sold them off like possessions. For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's now. Then whatever God has said to you, do it. <laughs> then Jacob rose and he set his sons and his wives on camels and he carried away all of his livestock and all his possessions in which he had gained. His acquired livestock, which he had gained in Padam Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. So he springs into action. He suddenly says, okay, you guys are on board. Let's go. I got the camels ready. Ready? Here we go. Pack a suitcase. We're packing light. That's sudden. But they said, listen, why are we sticking around? There's... You know, what's dad going to do for us? He's treated us like worthless. He's treated us like animals and he sold us off. What, why are we going to stick around here? Hey, Jacob, we're with you, man. Whatever you say, we're with you. That's a good thing when you're leading and someone says that, right? Trust me, it is. It's much worse for the converse to happen. So not only was his situation soured and God's small voice became sweetened, but also it was confirmed by counsel because he spoke to his family and it was consolidated there that his family agreed we should go. It's always a good idea to seek counsel, isn't it? And so he goes to his wives, which were the closest to him. Proverbs 11:14 says, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So the scripture says that you counsel with multitude of people. Now, you don't tell everybody your personal business, but you should tell some people your personal business because they're going to have a perspective that you don't have. Amen. And that's why this is called the body of Christ, isn't it? Because there are people that see different aspects of what's going on in your life that you may not see. Right. It also says Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, plans go awry or go off track. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So if you're making a plan, good idea to seek counsel because without a plan, you, you, you can go off, off the rails real quick. And Proverbs 24, 6, for by wise counsel, you will wage your own war. Isn't that an interesting way to put it? 
because we're all kind of waging our own war, aren't we? And in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Find some people that are smarter than you. It's always a compliment to a person if they gather people around themselves that are smarter than them. I've seen in corporate America, people who are managers and CEOs, they get intimidated when anyone is perhaps more driven than them or has better ideas than them or has a desire to push forward the agenda of the company more than them. They suddenly get very insecure about their positions. You don't believe me? But it's a great compliment to a person if they gather wise counselors around themselves. In fact, I'm so glad that we have a form of government that we do because it's not just one person you're electing. There are a whole bunch of people who actually advise them as well. And so it's a package. It's not just one person. So um, I'm glad for that. Although they may not be my pick, I will pray for them. And so wise counsel is always wise. Some of us, because we want to do what we want to do, don't seek counsel. We just do what we're going to do and say, well, the rest of you got to get over that. That's not a great way to lead, is it? Is it a good way to be a husband, do you think? My wife goes, what are you doing? Oh, I sold our car. You what? Yeah, I sold our car. Oh, I sold your car too. You what? Well, what are we going to do? Well, I just thought we need some exercise, so I got us new bicycles. <laughs> well, when are you going to tell me that? Well, I don't know. Now? Not a good way to lead. Not a good way to lead. It's a good idea to get some wise counsel. And also, there's a process to everything. Verse 19. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep. That, that's a sheep that needs a shearing right there. And Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. So she took for herself a parting gift. And Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban the Syrian, in that he did not tell what he intended to do and flee. And so he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed over the river and he headed toward the mountains of Gilead. So he's on his way out of town. Didn't leave word, didn't leave a forwarding address, didn't give him a cell phone number, nothing. He's out. He packs up and goes while Laban's busy in the field. Sheeping, uh, shearing sheep is not a small thing. It's a big deal, and it happens at certain times of the year. And it's, it's days of labor. It's not just a one-time event. So he picks this perfect opportunity to run out, and he doesn't say anything. How would you feel about that? Somebody just poof, disappeared, not on Facebook anymore. They don't respond on their phone anymore. I have people do this to me sometimes. They fall off the edge of the earth. And I usually just have to pray extra hard for them because they're, they're usually not in good places. But it happens. That's why I look around and I'm, I'm wondering, okay, who's not here today? Because I'm going to have to give them a call when I get, get here. So Laban is shearing his sheep while his son-in-law and his daughters are out, and Rachel takes the household gods, okay? By the way, if you, if you don't if you have any household gods, it might be the remote control. <laughs> Some of you might be very attached to that. Uh, you get a panicked look, you know, you're looking in the cushions, and it's a big deal, and you're sweating because there's a big game on or something. Anyway, so she takes the household idols. By the way, these are some that were actually recovered. These are from 1500 B.C., so this is right at the time that we're looking at this story. Uh, they're called teraphim. They're these little bitty things that represent gods, okay? They're not gods in themselves, but they represent gods. Some people treat them like they're gods, but they're also counted as um, kind of like a deed to a piece of property because they believe that these gods were over land. And there were certain gods of the hills, there were gods of the valleys, there were gods of the waters. And so it's almost like, hey, this is, this is the title deed to my land because this is the god that oversees this area. So it's almost like she's taking a deed to the property of Laban. It's more than just uh, a, a maladjusted uh, understanding of God. But we also understand that Laban is not a God-fearing man, at least the, the God of Yahweh. A fear-based actions are seldom the right ones. Now, Jacob is running away because he's afraid. 
Rachel's stealing these things because she's afraid. You have all of these fear-based motivations with all of these people, and it doesn't stop there. It just keeps going. You ever notice when you make a decision based on fear like that, it's seldom the right one? It's, it's really a sign of maturity for somebody to be able to think before speaking, <laughs> you know, because you can get afraid and, and do all kinds of crazy things. Trust me, out of fear, you can do crazy things. You can So what's in your wallet? <laughs> you know, idols, you know, you say idolatry. <laughs> it's so passe. It's so 1,500 years ago. <laughs> well, there are some people that would just absolutely freak out if they couldn't watch a certain ball game or if their TV broke or if suddenly they lost internet service. I mean, there are people that worship all kinds of things. You can turn on and watch the videos. You know, there's people throwing money around. And, you know, money is their God, very apparently, because that's what they worship. You know, they dress with diamonds and gold and bling, and it's all about that. Well, yeah, we still have idols. We still have idols. There are some people who make their children into idols. They'll do anything that anything the kids want, even if it's wrong. What are you, four years old? You deserve a brand new iPhone and unlimited access to the internet. <laughs> yes, some, th some things are evidence of idolatry. Verse 22, and Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. So three days later, somebody gets around to tell him, hey, uh, there's a giant space of nothing where your family used to be. <laughs> and then he took his brethren with him and he pursued him for seven days journey. And he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. But God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. So Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mountains of Gilead. So what he did is he went to this place called Gilead. So he came from way up here and came down all the way down to Gilead, which is right, in, right, uh, right here. And he camped in the mountains. So immediately he went over the river and he scurried into the mountains as, as fast as he could, like a little rat trying to run from Laban. And Laban caught up to him. Took him seven days to do it. He got a pretty good head start. And it sounds like he was really making time. So he goes into this place called Gilead, which is the mountainous area. It, it basically means a place of rocks, Gilead. It's, a, it's just this mountainous area with a lot of rocks. And he's kind of hiding out. Basically, God came to him and he said, you got to watch your tone when you speak to someone who's wronged you, right? He was given this warning. Make sure you don't say anything to him, good or bad. Why do you do that? Because Laban has a tendency to lose it. That's why. You're talking to my boy. Watch your tone. That's what he's telling him. He's telling him, watch his tone. If you know that you're a person that tends to raise your voice, you better meter it down. Amen? Amen. Okay. And so Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? Yeah, thanks for listening. That you have stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword. Why did you flee away secretly? You know, he's got a good point. At least there. And steal away from me and not tell me. For I might have sent you away with joy and songs. Yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> with timbrel and harp. Yeah, I don't think so. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters? He wanted nothing to do with them. <laughs> Listen, he's a con man. He's going to try to pull hard strings and make emotional, you know, speech, uh, throw guilt on him, okay? I couldn't even kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you've done foolishly in so doing. It is in my power to do you harm. But God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful that you don't speak to Jacob, either good or bad. And now you've surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house but why did you steal my gods? 
That is such a complex section. He's throwing guilt on Jacob for running away as he could. And he's trying to paint himself publicly, because by the way, there's tons of people around him. He's painting himself like this magnanimous provider when he's not at all. He didn't even let me kiss my sons and daughters. Are you kidding me? You didn't want anything to do with us while we were around. Now we're not around. Suddenly it's, it's all kisses and hugs. It's a line. You get that? And it's not just because I'm sarcastic all the time. It's true. He's throwing them a line. And then he says, why did you steal my gods? And it's interesting. It's right in the same sentence where he says, your God came to me and spoke to me last night, but he's got other gods. So you see, Laban is not a fearer of Yahweh. He's a worshiper of other gods. By the way, these are the tablets of Nuzi. Now, these tablets include treaties, marriage arrangements, rules regarding inheritance, adoption, and the like. And it tells us that these are called teraphim. And I showed you previously these little bitty, these are so cute. <laughs> Makes you want to set up a shrine in your house and just bow down and worship them, right? No, I don't think so. Anyway. The, the tablets you see on the left-hand side, uh, the some 200,000 cuneiform clay tablets discovered in the ruins of Nuzi, uh, east of the Tigris River, and datable to about 1500 BC, reveal institutions, practices, and customs remarkably congruent to those found in Genesis. Obviously, this is a secular finding, and they dug this up, and they were like, wow, this remarkably matches Genesis. Amazing. How did these people know? It's because it's the word of God. That's why. And suddenly all of archaeology is proving that the Bible's correct, 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 all the way down the line. So just so that you know, that's what, that's what these things look like. I can't imagine making them, but uh, I'm glad I don't have to. So listen, as far as Rachel's concerned, you want to be careful what you bring with you. When the Lord calls you to go somewhere else, be careful what you take with you. Because there might be things that you should leave behind. Might be the very reason God's calling you to go, is to leave some of those things behind. But so she brings with her a little memento. She puts it in her pocket. It'll be something else that the Lord has to remove from them at some point. In Zechariah 10 too, it says, for the idols speak delusion, the diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. People that rely upon idols to lead them, you'll always be able to tell because they're aimless and they just go according to their emotion. How do you feel? I feel good today, so I'm going to do this thing. I feel bad today, so I'm not going to do anything. I feel, I feel. It could be your feelings are your idol. Pastor Dave said that. <laughs> That's the sign that somebody is not following a very well-ordered plan that God has given, but they're following maybe the dictates of their own emotions. So it happens. And then Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid. That's why he ran away, because he was afraid. For I said, perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force because he trusts Laban infinitely, of course. With whomever you find your gods, do not let him live. Ooh. You see, Jacob doesn't uh, have any idea that Rachel, his favorite wife, stole them. And she's got them in her pocket. So if you find anybody who stole these things, don't let them live. Uh, I'm, I'm giving them to you. I'm giving you their life, whoever took these things. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, because he's, you know, he's uh, the suspect number one, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maids' tents, but he did not find them. And then he went out to Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now, Rachel had taken the household idols put them in a camel's saddle, and sat on them. And Laban searched all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, let it not displease you, my Lord, that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is with me. And he searched, but he did not find the household idols. 
She's a tricky one, she is. So apparently she doesn't have much respect for these things because she's sitting on them in a saddle and these are clay objects. They're, you know, they're not indestructible. And she's lying about having them. So he says, if you find them, whoever it is forfeits their life. And it's a good thing they didn't find them in Rachel's possession. That would have been a real problem. Say, like, well, just check, check in the couch. They're probably there. You know, check between the cushions. That's usually where the remote is. So. Beware of making rash statements that you may not have all the facts. Amen. Beware of making rash statements like, if you find these idols anywhere, you can kill them. Well, be careful you don't say such things in an act of passion, right? You ever, you ever get really angry and then say something you're really sorry you said? Yeah. Yep. Two of you, okay. <laughs> Apparently this lesson is completely lost on all of you, except for the two. Be careful not to say things that you don't mean. Like, your kid does something. And you're so angry, you say, you're grounded for three months. Do you know what you just did? You just grounded yourself for three months. Don't say rash things in a, in a fit of anger. Why don't you take it to the Lord and talk it over with him. And then, when you have your wits about you and you're going to say something profitable then you can say something profitable. But I understand a righteous man has nothing to be afraid of. Uh, so that's probably where it came from. But you want to be careful because he's in the hands of a con artist here. Then Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban because he didn't find anything. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, what is my trespass? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? Although you have searched all my things, what part of your household things have you found? Set it here before my brethren and your brethren that they may judge between us both. So he's got a jury selected right there. These 20 years I have been with you. You get the idea, the steam's been building for 20 years. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young and have eaten, I have not eaten the rams of your flock. In other words, I didn't eat anything off your plate. That which was torn by beasts, I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. You returned, you required it of my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was in the day, the drought consumed me and frost by night and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus, I have been in your house 20 years. He's a little emotional. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for my flock. Now, he's saying this not necessarily to Laban, but everyone listening. You see, he's pleading his case. And you have changed my wages 10 times. I can see everybody going, oh, he told, he's saying this. <laughs> Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. <sighs> he finally got it out. I put it all on one slide. He's upset because he's been chased, cheated, and charged. And he's now dumped his gut and told him the truth in front of everybody. And it's funny, he didn't inflate any of it. It's all true. And he's given it to Laban the way Laban should have gotten it served to him probably long before this point. And Laban answered and said to Jacob, these daughters are my daughters and these children are my children and this flock is my flock. He just put his daughters, his grandchildren and animals all in the same category as possessions. I own them. That's what he's saying. This guy's a materialist. You get it? Yeah. All that you see is mine. <laughs> but what can I do this day to these my daughters and to their children whom they have born? You see, he's not even involved in any of this. Now, therefore, come. Let us make a covenant, you and I. And let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and he set it up as a pillar because that's what Jacob does. And Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and they made a heap and they ate there on the heap. Laban called it Jager Sahadutha, 
But Jacob called it Galid. I, I like Galid better. It's a little simpler to say. Not nearly as emotional. So these two con artists are having a competition. They, they, they're, they're even doing it with the rocks. He sees people as possessions. This guy's a pure materialist. He sees everything in relation to himself. The whole world revolves around him. You may know people like this. I hope you're not a people like this. But he sees everything as his. It means heap of witness, by the way, Galid, and also Jagor Sahadutha. They, they both are the same thing, two different languages. One is in Aramaic and one is in Hebrew, so that's why you have the two different names. And so it, they have this stone. So what they're doing is they're setting up a boundary because Jacob's going to stay on his side and Laban's going to stay on his side and they're never going to see each other again. That's what's going on. You're out of here. Take your stuff, take my wives, take my grandchildren, take all my flocks, and I never want to see you again. That's what's going on. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, its name is called Galid. Also, Mitzpah. It, it means a place of watching. It's uh, very much said of towers and, and hills. Mitzpah, because he said, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. Have you guys heard that before? Some years ago, it used to be a thing. You know, if you get a girlfriend, you know, you get this little medallion that says, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. And it's this round thing that has a crack down the middle. And she wears half and you wear half. Aww. That's not the sense in which this is being made. This is a contract, which is you stay on your side, I'm going to stay on my side, and God is going to watch between me and you while we're away from each other, okay? You stay on your side. That's really what it is. Oh, thank you. So that's the mitzvah anyway. Sorry to ruin your romantic ideas of that. Not really. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, why would he be against that? He, anyway, although no man is with, is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. And then Laban said to Jacob, here is the heap, and here is the pillar. Notice they're still competing. He's got a pillar, he's got a pile. <laughs> Which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness. I don't know what the heap's going to do. And this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pass beyond the heap and, and this pillar to me for harm. So they're making a peace treaty, but they're going to go away forever. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us. Well, whoa, wait a minute. Abraham's father worshiped the moon god. Since when was this ever the God of Nahor? He's got, he's got little idols that get sat on. <laughs> and Jacob swore by the fear of his father, Jacob. By the way, it's the one whom Isaac feared. It's the God of Jacob, or the God of Isaac, rather. And Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread. It's a fellowship offering. And they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. And Laban departed and returned to his place. So there's one of those little mitzvah things. So if, if you're interested in giving a piece of that to a friend, it means stay away. So, like who, is there anyone who does an exegetical study of the scriptures and then does this? It's like... It's going to make us a lot of money. People don't know. Let's just make these things. Let's, anyway, there is no more mention of Laban in the scripture narrative from this point. He goes away forever. And this is the break. He's going away from his family, and he's finally going to start on his own. It's a great place where God's going to speak to him and work other things out of his life. It's a great thing to do. It's to get out on your own. That's what I'd be doing. Bye-bye. Have fun storming the castle. <laughs> and it take a miracle. 
Okay. So that is the end of chapter 31. Got through 55 verses. Thank you for being patient. Next week, one more slide for next week. We got good people here, man. We got good people. They're on it. Next week, we're going to look at Jacob going home and the things that he has to face. Some of you will understand what I say. Some of us deal with our problems by running away, like Jacob did. Some of us deal with our problems by hiding, like Jacob did. You know, you can run and you can hide, but ultimately God wants us to do everything that we can to live at peace with one another. And he's going to cause these things to always be brought up. And he's going to bring Jacob to a place where he's completely alone. And the Lord's going to come to him and speak to him before he meets his brother Esau, who's got a head on him. <laughs>